Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 267. For this one, we're playing a massive high stakes streamed game at the Lodge in Austin, Texas. It's 25, 50, 100. But before we get started, one announcement to make, that's that the WPT World Championship is coming back to the win in Las Vegas this December. Last year we did it, it's a $10,400 buy-in. It had a $15 million guarantee. This year, it's a $40 million guarantee. The best way to get yourself a seat is to sign up to WPT Global using the bonus code VLOG. That'll get you a deposit match bonus up to $1,200. Plus, you'll receive a free satellite ticket. There are satellites running on Global all the time, and you can win a $10,400 seat for as little as $5 on Global. So I'll have more details in the description box below. If you win one of those satellite packages, you'll also receive an additional $2,000 for travel expenses. Uh, last year we had what was called a premier mug. Phil Ivey, Doyle Brunson, Steve Aoki, Patrick Antonius, and the entire WPT family was there. It was a blast. This year we're gonna do something similar. So if you're able to make it out to the WPT for the World Championship, even if you don't play the main event, it's just one of the best series of the entire year and you really can't miss it. So I have more details in the description box below and not all the details are ironed out yet for the Premier Mug this year, but it'll be at the start of the series to kick it off. Hopefully you can make it and everything is at the win, which is just my favorite property and, and the nicest property, nicest casino that I've ever been to. All right guys, let's go ahead and get started. We start the morning off eating multiple tacos with the Lodge's own Skull Mike. This is the fuel we need before battling on stream for my last high stakes session of the trip. Coming off of an $18,600 win the day before, I'm looking to add to it. After arriving on property, I buy in for $20,000. If I can get the win today, I'll pretty much guarantee a profitable trip to Austin, even though I have several more days playing smaller stakes ahead. It sounds simple enough, but it won't be easy. First of all, we're starting out six-handed, which isn't the format that I'm best at or prefer, and we're playing with all familiar faces, including the two biggest winners from the previous session that was highlighted in the last vlog. Yushan won over 60,000 yesterday, and Alex won 50,000. They're both extremely aggressive players who relentlessly 3-bet. We're playing 25-50-100 with $100 big blind Annie, plus there are regular straddles and double straddles. There's nowhere to hide, we'll have to play well, and we'll have to run well if we want to come out ahead. If we don't, we could end up losing 100,000 or more. Shortly into the session, we pick up pocket fours under the gun, I raise to 300. Almost on cue, Alex puts in a disrespectful 3-bet to 1,000. When you have an opponent like this on your direct left, it can make for a miserable session, particularly if you aren't dealt many strong hands to fight back with. I've gotten the better of Alex in other medium and large pots on stream in the past, but he's never had position on me like this. He's looking to take advantage of it and get revenge. We've got a hand with plenty of potential. I call for 700 more in order to set mine. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes 7-5 deuce with two hearts and a spade. It's not the best flop, but it isn't the worst either. I wouldn't expect it to connect well with the pre-flop aggressor's range. I check. Alex is going to stick with his story that he's harboring a monster. He continues with a down bet of 800. I don't know if fours are the best hand at the moment. What I do know is that my opponent and I are both aware that I could easily have all the sets. Plus, there are a lot of cards that can help us improve as we have some decent backdoor potential. Not only can we hit a 4 to make a set, but any ace, 3, 6, or 8 gives us a straight draw, and a heart gives us a flush draw that may or may not be good. I take this weak $800 bet, and I raise the 2000 to fold out hands containing 2 overs that will have a lot of equity. If we get called and get a good turn card, we'll continue with the aggression. Alex feels good enough about his bottom pair and backdoor flush draw. He calls to see another card. The dealer puts out the 6 of diamonds, giving us the open ender. It's another card that should be great for us, pretty bad for the pre-flop 3 better most of the time. We keep the pressure on with about a 2 thirds sizing of 4,000. It'd be great to win this immediately, but if the opponent has an overpair and calls once more, we'll have to prepare ourselves to make a river shove whether or not we make a straight. Since Alex doesn't improve, he lets it go, we win a fairly large pot, but this is only round 1. An orbit later we pick up our signature hand, the Jiggities, I raised it 300. Alex won't let me get away with anything today, he puts in another 3 bet to 1,000. It's early on and nothing has gotten to showdown yet, so there's no way for me to know how strong or weak Alex has been with his re-raises. I call for 700 more, we're heads up again, the flop comes, ace, king, eight, all hearts, it's about the worst flop I could imagine, there are two overs and three to the flush out there for a suit that we don't have, plus, I know this is a great flop for the three betters range, I check, 
Alex is gonna bet 100% of the hands that he'll have, whether he actually connected or not. In this case, he has me crush with top pair. I can't call a bet no matter what, and don't wanna waste anyone's time. I fold before Alex even acts because this situation is so disadvantageous. Alex isn't totally shocked. We're pretty friendly with each other. He shows that he had the winner with an ace. He wins round two. We've gotten a seventh player and the whole table agrees to play the Nick game. I'm not a fan in this game because over the last 12 months, I've lost nearly a quarter million dollars while playing it. If it wasn't for this game, I'd probably be even or even winning lifetime at the lodge. Still, I agree to it to appease the viewers and the rest of the table. I get that it's fun for them. The way it works is a nit button is placed in front of each player. If anyone wins a pot, the nit button's removed and the last person with the button in front of them has to pay everyone else a $300 fee. In the first hand of the nit game, our newest player, Justin, picks up a premium with a short stack and raises to 400. It's a larger than normal size raise, especially from under the gun. We've got big slick ourselves, and with the nit game being on, and in an attempt to get it all in against Justin, I go with a big 3-bet sizing to 2,000. I don't expect anyone else to get involved, but Yushan just made a quick trip to his Auntie Anne's. He gets pretzels and doesn't want to relinquish them. It's probably tempting for him to maybe even 4-bet. If we happen to get it in against him, we'd be in bad shape with only 4 outs. Instead, Yushan cold calls the 3-bet. Justin takes one last gander at his cards. There's no way that he's ever laying Ace-King down for 1,600 more. In fact, with only 86.25 remaining in his stack, he knows what he's got to do. He 4-bet jams. It's possible that he could be doing this with Ace-Queen or a hand we're flipping with. I want to isolate him, so I 5-bet jam to get Yushan out. Yushan has to fold. We force out the best hand to play a $20,000 all-in pot that'll likely be a chop. We at least get an extra 2,000 from a third opponent to possibly split. The flop comes Ace-King-Queen. Both flop, two pair. There's no real sweat. For formality purposes, we see that we both turn to boat and hit 75% of our outs against pocket eights. The river is the ten of hearts. We both make a little extra money, but since it's a chop, neither of us are able to get rid of our knit buttons. A few hands later, I get an opportunity with Queen Jack offsuit under the gun. I raise to 300. Andrew defends his big blind without looking at his cards. He's in bad shape. We're heads up in position. The flop comes king six deuce rainbow. Andrew checks. I put out a C bet of 200. Andrew's forced to look at this point and has nothing. He reveals the garbage that he called the pre-flop raise with and folds. I'm excited that we won the pot and don't have to pay out 1800 to the table for losing the nick game. Except, I return the cards to the dealer face down on accident. I forgot to mention earlier that in order to win the game and get rid of the nit button, each player is supposed to show the table what they won the hand with, and if you don't reveal the winning hand, you aren't able to get rid of the nit button, so I'm potentially still on the hook to have to pay out 300 to each opponent if I don't win another pot and turn over my cards. A few hands later, Andrew wins a pot and leaves me as the last person to win a pot and actually reveal their cards. Rather than win 300 from him, I have to pay out 300 to all six opponents. Not showing the queen jack earlier cost me $2,100. Next, we've got pocket nines first to act with a $200 straddle on. I raise the 600. Andrew has an over in the straddle. He calls with high hopes of hitting. The flop comes ace-queen-jack with two spades. He gets there, but he checks. There's a good hand to check back with, but I know that I have the range advantage, so I can't help myself. I go with a small bet of 400, turning it into a bluff. Even if Andrew has something like jack-8 suited, he may want to fold. He's not letting go a top pair, though. He calls. The turn is the deuce of hearts. Andrew checks. Figure our nines are no good unless Andrew has a flush draw. Since we can have the nuts, all the sets, and two pair hands that Andrew won't necessarily have, it could be tough for him to call a second barrel out of position with a hand like the one he's got. I keep the pressure on and bet 1300 It's not very often that I attempt double barrel bluffs against Andrew. He can't fold though, he matches the bet, and I start to suspect that he could be pretty strong. The river is another queen, it's a bad card because Andrew could have something like queen x of spades, queen jack, king queen, or queen ten. He checks. It's too risky to fire a big bet when I could be up against trips or better. Andrew may even have a tough time folding an ace. And we at least beat Miss Flush Draws. I check back to give up. Andrew lets me know that he has an ace. All of a sudden, he's a few thousand dollars richer. I'm down about 2,500, but it's still early on in the session. With another straddle on, Boots raises to 500 from the cutoff. I'm in the third blind with the speed limit. I call for 400 more. Alex is in the $200 straddle. He's got a hand I'd expect him to just call with to close the action the vast majority of the time. 
I'm not sure what he's using for a randomizer, but I think it's broken since he's not mixing in anything. He's 3-betting 100% of the time when it's at least somewhat reasonable, and about 50% of the time when it's not at all. In this case, he 3-bets at 2300 with a reasonably reasonable hand. He clears out the equity that Boots has as the preflop aggressor folds. I should really be folding this hand and surprisingly even much better pocket pairs because the straddler isn't supposed to be 3-betting too wide of a range. By now, I realized Alex isn't playing by the book. I call hoping to finally make a set after having multiple pocket pairs. The flop comes 9-6 deuce with two diamonds, no set for us, we're in bad shape. I check, Alex has to at least be a little concerned that we could have a set, yet he wants to keep control of the pot. Alex down bets at 2000. He played his queen deuce suited hand similarly, in which he 3-bet, flop bottom pair, and down bet. Once again, we have plenty of cards that will help us improve to either a straight draw or a set. This time, I call rather than check raise. The turn is the 9 of diamonds completing the front door flush draw and pairing the board. I check immediately. Neither of us really love this card. Alex does pick up a flush draw though. He doesn't want this pot to get out of control in case he's drawing dead to an 8. He checks back. At this point, I rule out him having a full house, trips, and most over pairs. He'll often have just ace high and he won't have a flush. The river is another deuce, double pairing the board. I'd like to get to showdown with what will often be the best hand. I check. Alex can rule out me having a strong hand after I only check called flop, check turn, and checked river after a check through on the previous street. My hand looks like I've got exactly what I've got, or maybe worse. Alex winds up and announces a bet of 6,500. We see me wincing here because I don't think Alex will have an overpair or better that often like he's representing. I wouldn't expect him to have 3-bet preflop with the hand that he has, and I wouldn't expect him to go for value with 8s very frequently on the river, so it feels like a bluff. Once a check through on the turn, I had it in my mind that I'll often beat often enough to justify calling a river bet if it's a blank. I call and get my chips in there before Alex does. He shows that he wrecks my world. I have to give him credit for knowing where he was at and continuing to go for value. I could have and probably should have folded at multiple points throughout the hand, including to the pre-flop 3 bet, the flop bet, and the river bet. Against other players, I'd be more inclined to abort, but Alex's image and our history together gets him paid. I don't want to be left short, so I add on for 25,000 more. I'm in for 45,000 total. The leaderboard says I'm down 11,000. That's only because it isn't counting the extra 1,800 that I paid out for losing the Nick game. I'm actually down 13,000. We're playing very high stakes, so I can't let my emotions get the best of me and unravel. It's important to remain as composed as possible. We're really only one big pot away from getting out of the hole. I just need to avoid compounding mistakes. Shortly after, Yushan is on the button with a playable hand while I've straddled to 200. He raises to 600. Rhonda's in the big blind. She calls. I'm at the bottom of my range with 10-8 offsuit. I call for 400 more to close the action. We're going three ways to the flop. It comes 10-4 deuce with two clubs. We've got top pair. Checks to the pre-flop aggressor. He's got a piece with his wheel draw, backdoor flush draw, and overcard. He bets 700. Rhonda has air. She folds. I'm content to see another card, I call with a good lead. The turn is the queen of spades, I don't like seeing an over card come out. I check, what Yushan does will be very telling. I've already been suspicious that he didn't have much because we have removal of the hands containing a 10. If he bets again, his story is that he either has an over pair, a set, two pair, or top pair. It's less likely that he has a set or two pair, and he might check back with some top pair hands that aren't also flush draws. Yushan fires anyway with a bet of 2500. He's down over 30,000 at the moment, and this feels like he's trying to get me to fold. It's hard to believe that he has a queen or better like he's representing. It's too early to lay it down. I call, hoping that I'm up against King Jack, Ace King, Ace Jack, or Jack Nine type of hand with only one or zero clubs. The dealer puts out the Queen of Clubs. It's a very interesting card. In some ways, I like seeing it because there are fewer combinations containing a queen that the opponent could have. On the other hand, it's a club, so the flush draw gets there. I check. Now if Yushan bets, he'd be saying that he has trip queens or better. He'd probably check back an overpair, and he might have checked a flush draw on the turn to ensure that he could realize his equity. I'm just not convinced that he's that strong, especially given that we have removal to full houses. If he bets all three streets, despite the board changing significantly from the flop to the river, I may have to go with my gut and call. Yushan takes out some big chips and bets 7,000. It's almost a pot sized bet that puts me in a difficult spot. The situation is made tougher by the fact that I just made a similar call like this against Alex and it was incorrect. 
I need to keep every hand isolated and make the best decisions I can in the moment while blocking out the results of previous hands. Yushan is stuck and very capable of bluffing. The most likely hand I thought that he was betting for value on the turn was a combination like ace-queen or king-queen of clubs. Now that the queen of clubs has been accounted for, it's more probable that we're up against air. 7,000. Oh. Brad makes the call. Snap call, there, Brad. call from Brad. Brad usually just makes up his mind there. Usually takes a little bit more time, but he had a plan. If Yushan fires, I'm snapping. And this time he sees the good news. Well played, Brad. It feels great to win a big pot of over 20,000 with just a medium strength hand. This one makes up for the big loss against Alex. I'm only down a much more manageable 2,000, and things are going in the right direction. With the double straddle to 400 on, Yushan picks up another hand that he wants to get involved with on the button. He raises to 1,200. I'm in the $200 straddle with 10-8 suited, I mix things up slightly, and 3-bet with the bubblegum chip to 5,000. You didn't think I was just going to sit back and play it safe now that we're close to even, did you? The gloves are off, and the fact that there's a $400 straddle on essentially makes an already big 25-50-100 game four times bigger. Having Alex behind me in the $400 straddle is what made me more inclined to 3-bet rather than call with a suited 1-gapper. Alex has been 3-betting so much, and my image is solid, so my aggression limits Alex's ability to put on a big squeeze. He folds. Yushan doesn't mind playing a larger pot in position. He calls. We're heads up with five figures up for grabs in the middle. This could be tricky to navigate. The flop comes 9-9-8 with two hearts. Mostly like seeing it. There aren't many combinations of trip nines that Yushan will be holding since we've got spades around the nine, so Yushan won't have 10-9 or 9-8 as spades. This is a flop our opponent wouldn't expect us to connect with often after three betting. I don't want this pot to get out of control. So I check rather than bet and potentially get raised not knowing for sure if we're ahead or behind. Yushan takes a small stab for 2,500. I'm comfortable playing for that amount. I call. The pot increases to over 15,000. The turn is the three of clubs. It's pretty much a blank. I check with plans of calling another bet if we need to. The opponent slows down and checks back. We get to the river where we can see Chris Farley's van and the six of spades. Some very unlikely straight draws get there. Pocket sixes also improves to a set, but that's it. No other hands improved to take the lead from us. So much money in the middle, I check for pot control. I want to get to showdown. Yushan still has the memory of me calling him down with a pair of tens fresh in his mind. He checks back. We turn over the winner. It's another big pot that goes our way. It's even sweeter because it gets us all the way out of the hole that we were in earlier. And now we've got some profit to play with. We're up almost 5,000, plus we really haven't made any strong hands so far. If the sets, straights, or flushes start coming, we could turn this into a very lucrative day. The $200 straddle's on. Yushan is first to act as he raises a 600. I've got A6 suited, and I call in the big blind. With multiple players behind me, I should really just be folding though. If it weren't a stream, I'd probably let it go, but there's so much emphasis on keeping the VPIP up and entertaining the live audience. Still, it's not too big of a deal to stay in there. Alex makes a completely out of line call from the third blind with a dirty diaper. Boots is in the straddle. He calls. His hand is far more reasonable and it's in its own lane. We're going four ways to the flop. It comes ace jack four rainbow. We've got top pair, but we're dominated and don't have any backdoor draws to save us. It checks to the preflop aggressor who hits the flop hard. He bets 800. It's less than one third the size of the pot. The fact that Yushan bet into three opponents certainly sets off some alarm bells, but he could be doing this with some straight draws, knowing that it's a good flop for his range compared to everyone else's. I call one time. If Yushan continues firing on later streets, we'll have to reevaluate. Alex has an extremely hidden straight draw and is getting a great price. He calls. Boots folds. It's down to three of us. The turn is the Queen of Diamonds, giving Yushan top two pair. It also completes straight draws, which were the only hands I was really beating that might have bet into multiple opponents. Checks to Yushan again. He's not concerned that Alex or I could have the nuts. He fires for 3,600. There's very little chance that this is a bluff, and I don't beat any hands that he'd be betting for value. I fold knowing that Yushan or Alex or both players could have me in bad shape. In this case, Alex has the nut low and folds as well. We at least make the correct laydown on the turn and get away from top pair without losing too much. We're playing the Nick game for the final time. Andrew straddled a 200. I'm first to act and I raise a 600 without looking at my cards. The reason I'm playing blind is that I'm one of the last three people left with the nit button and there's been an insane amount of three betting. I figure opening from early position will give me the best chance to win a pot or at least go heads up to a flop without getting three bet light. It doesn't really matter what I have. Fortunately, we pick up a decent hand. 
No one knows that I was only faking it when I pretended to look at my cards pre-flop, so when Boots sees my raise, he assumes I made it with a narrow range of hands, and he elects not to 3-bet the Jiggities, he just calls. I told you it'd be less likely that I'd get re-raised if I opened from early position. We indeed go heads up to the flop, it comes King-6-3 with two spades, maybe I should play blind all the time. I still haven't looked at my cards yet, I just know that a king-high flop will typically be better for me, I bet 700. Boots doesn't hesitate much, he calls. This is when I look at my cards for the first time and I'm pleasantly surprised that we've got top pair. The turn is the queen of clubs, now I'm content to get to showdown without putting too much more in the middle. I check, Boots checks back, the river is the nine of spades so the flush draw gets there and so does jack 10. I check. Boots checks back immediately, and you hear me come clean about not looking at my hand pre-flop. King 10. I actually played this one blind. Yes, contest is over. Did you really? <laughs> that worked out about as well as I could have imagined. We avoid losing the nick game and avoid having to pay out another 1800. Two hands later, Boots is one of the last players left with the nip button. He raises to 500. Yushan has a mystery hand. He three bets to 1500. These are the first two players to act. I'm in the third blind with ace-king offsuit as the graphic comes up to show Yushan also has ace-king. I cold 4 bet to 4,500. Boots folds. The action is back on Yushan who started the hand with about 25,000. I've already made up my mind that if he jams, I'll be calling, but I won't love it. Yushan rips it in for piles. I call thinking that I could be up against aces, kings, or queens. We're playing a 50,000 all-in pot. I turn over our cards takes a little while before I see Yushan has the same hand, and I'm mostly relieved. I've been dealt so few strong hands today, when I have had ace-king, someone else has somehow had it as well. Spades aren't live for me, so Yushan has the advantage because he'll win if four spades come out or if four hearts come out, whereas the only way I'll win is if four clubs come out. It's a bit of a sweat, but the flop comes jack-9-6 rainbow, it'll be another chop. I don't mind it too much, the session is close to finishing up. Other than the previous time when I've chopped with ace-king versus ace-king, I haven't made two pair better using both cards. And I haven't been dealt aces, kings, or queens all day. I'm just running a bit cold. I do get a different strong pocket pair in this hand though. Boots raises to 300 from under the gun. We get the jiggities in the big blind. We won't be calling to allow Alex an opportunity to see a relatively cheap flop. I grab chips and re-raise to 1300. Boots only has 16,000 total. I'd be willing to get it in against him for that amount. Instead, he calls for a thousand more to see a flop, we're heads up out of position, maybe I'll finally make a set. The flop comes queen 10 6 rainbow, it's not good because it could be up against all the sets or an ace queen or king queen type of hand. I check, Boots has two overs and a gut shot straight draw to give him some equity, he might be concerned that I'm slow playing a set though, he checks back. The turn is the four of clubs changing nothing, after Boots checked back the flop, I'm more confident that we could have the best hand. We could potentially be up against ace 10 suited, a lower pocket pair that didn't improve, ace king or ace jack. I make a small bet of 900 to target those worse holdings. Boots likes the price, he calls to see one last card, the dealer puts out the 5 of diamonds, it's another brick, it still feels like we've got the best hand but the hands that we're beating can't call a large bet. I go small again and bet 1500. Even though the opponent only has ace high, he's not quick to let go. Maybe he's thinking about putting in a raise to steal it from us, or maybe he's considering calling because he thinks the nut no pair could be the winner sometimes. About 40 seconds go by, then under the gun finally folds. I let him know that I had the best hand as I show him the jiggities. That's the last interesting hand that I'd get involved with on the stream. Even though we didn't get much to work with, we navigate through some tough spots and pull out a victory. Andrew's the big winner on the day. Alex and Yushan won a ton on the previous day's stream, but they end up at the bottom of the leaderboard today, losing most of their profit back. Of the four people who played two high stakes stream sessions in a row, I end up being the only person who booked back to back wins. I'm very happy about that, and to have the high stakes sessions behind me for the trip before playing the meetup game and some fall mayhem tournaments. Today, we both won, me and Andrew. It's a rare day when that happens, but uh, it's always nice when it does. Uh, I won 5,300, so over the last three days, I, the first stream I lost 11,700, 
Uh, I had all of myself, and then yesterday I won 18,600 at half of myself. Today I won 5,300 at half of myself. So personally, kind of broke even, even though in total on stream, I won 10 to 12,000 or something. But a big story of today is Andrew crushed it, ran well, uh, in, and played well in, in big pots, and they all seem to go your way. How's it feel? It feels good. Yeah, it feels good. How much did you get him for? Uh, we won 70,000. 70,000. Uh, he'll probably have the vlog out before this one comes out, so I'll put a link down below in the description box for that. And uh, nice win, dude. We're gonna go out and celebrate. Dinner is on Andrew, and then I'm gonna get something, something nice. Andrew wanted to take us out for sushi. I get a couple of rolls for myself that are delicious. We celebrate Andrew's biggest win that he's ever had with a couple of guys from the lodge, including our stream producer, Matt, and our commentators, Slick Rick and Skull Mike. It's a great night overall, and the fun is just beginning for me. The next day, I suck out to win a $13,000 pot in a 5-5-10 game with a 5K cap. It was a streamed game that I wasn't a part of, but the players wanted to keep the game going after the broadcast ended, so I hopped in late and managed to hit a Miracle River after getting it in with Top Top and the Ace High Flush draw versus a flopped King High Flush. I ended up winning 8400 on the session, and I had all of myself. The day after, we have the biggest meetup game of all time. We get hundreds of people and 34 total tables of 1-2 going. It's an absolute blast as the place is packed and I get an amazing gift from a viewer named Aaron. Oh, there we go, man. Signed by Hunter my, Pence. My Holy pleasure, shit. Man. My pleasure. Awesome, dude. Yep. Thank you very much. No problem. That is so cool. The following day, the Fall Mayhem series kicks off, which is why we have all these trophies. I'm usually only at the lodge to kick off our tournament series with streams and meetup games, so I haven't played that many tournament bullets, and I haven't actually ever cashed in a lodge tournament. I said before the trip that I wasn't going to leave Austin until that changed. We kick off the series with some PLO events, I give updates on Instagram covering my runs. The second PLO event is particularly interesting. It's a $200 buy-in with $50 bounties on each player. Andrew and I are firing away on his sixth bullet. He finally runs up a decent stack to work with. I sneak in a fifth bullet right before registration ends. This is the one that sticks. I run up a decent stack of my own. Andrew and I both make the money. There were 88 total entries in the top nine players cash. We're excited to make our first live final table together and have a shot at the first place prize of over 3,000 as well as a trophy. We're in for a lot of bullets each, so we'll need to get in four digit payout territory just to break even. Gets down to four players, that includes me and Andrew, when I get it in as a short stack with ace, queen, jack, five, double suited, but unfortunately I'm up against pocket aces with my diamonds being obsolete. I flop a pair, I don't improve though, I get knocked out in fourth place, the good news is that I secure my first ever lodge tournament cash, and I recover all the buy-ins with the payout. I also knocked out three players for $50 each, so I profited $150. I'm not leaving the property just yet either. It's after midnight when Andrew's battling three-handed for the victory. The structure of the tournament may be too good because playing this out might take several more hours. The chip leader at the table in the one seat who has about 50% of the chips in play just wants to get the tournament over with. So he proposes an even chop, not even an ICM chop. This means all the players would get the same amount of money regardless of how many chips they have. It really benefits two other players with the smaller stacks. Andrew wants a shot at winning the trophy, so he proposes that they're all guaranteed over 2,000, and then they do a flip to end it. Whoever wins the flip will get an extra 600 and the trophy. Two other players agree to the flip. Andrew has the best hand after turning the street. River doesn't change anything. Andrew gets the victory. He's the official winner of event number two. We both had great trips overall, but Andrew really crushed it and comes home with some hardware. We have an awesome time setting records and making some new memories at our favorite card club. That's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons. It helps out the channel a ton. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comment section. I'm happy to get back to you. Getting through these streams was something that was kind of stressful. It's always fun when you win and then you look back at it. But uh, I, I'm just really glad that I left Austin with a lot more money than I, I came in with. Uh, I had a big loss on stream. Um, my first day I lost 11,700 and I had 100% of myself. The second day I had 18,600. Um, that's how much I won. And then the third day I won 5,200, but I only had half of myself when I was playing the high stakes streams. So 
Uh, I kind of personally broke even for those streamed games, but then afterwards I said that I won 8,400 uh, the next day and then I won in the meetup game and in a few other cash game sessions and I got my first ever Lodge cash uh, in a tournament. So it was a great trip overall. Thanks to everybody who came out for the largest ever meetup game that we had. That was awesome. And I hope to see you guys out in December for the WPT World Championship. Be sure to sign up to WPT Global using that bonus code VLOG to get the deposit match up to $1,200 and the free satellite ticket. Again, you can win a $10,400 seat to the World Championship for as little as $5. So take advantage of that deal. Um, hope you guys are all doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Good luck at the tables and I'll see you next time.